with all the blessings that we have enjoyed this week, I have considered with you now Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 8, and if you would find verse 10 in there, you'll find it to be quite fitting for us. The title of my message this morning is The Joy of the Lord. And uh, indeed, uh, you'll find it. We talked last time I preached to you, I was uh, speaking to you about uh, Nehemiah's desire to go home. As you remember, the Jewish people are. Uh, that one? My battery must be dead. Ooh, we'll give them a point. All right. We'll either preach louder or use a different mic. I put it in the battery, I thought I put it in the battery. Think about batteries, they all look alike. Yeah. Can't tell if they're dead or alive, right? <laughs> you want to make sure you can tell the difference. So. All right, thank you. All right. Thank you. Put it out here in man's eyes. All right. Okay, praise the Lord. All right, so if you would, Nehemiah. Pull it back just a little bit on the end. Because God told them that every 50 years or every 49 years, they were supposed to leave the ground fallow. Don't plow it. Don't plant it. You leave the ground alone once every 50 years. That was mine. Well, you know, it's kind of hard sometimes to believe God. It's so much easier to go out and plow your own field, plant your own corn, and say, thank you, Jesus. Right? And so that's kind of like religion. You do all your own work. You hope you're going to get to heaven so you can pat yourself on the back. But God's going to stop you at the gate. In fact, these people did their own planting and plowing. Every 50 years, they ignored that. God let it go until there were uh, uh, 70 years of these 50s. 50, 50, 50, 70 times. And finally, God said, oh, hey, by the way, it's time for me to collect. Collect what? Well, remember I told you every 50 years you're supposed to leave the ground alone and you didn't? You owe me 70 years now of leaving the ground alone. So he took the Jews out of the land. And the land sat vacant for 70 years. Because God gets what God said he's going to get. And so the people were removed from the land because of their disobedience to God. Because of their lack of honoring His Word. Listen, honor God's Word. Period. Read it. Write it. Remember it. Okay? You've got to. These people didn't. And for 70 years, God took them first by the Assyrians, and then by the Babylonians, and finally by the Persians. They were held captive by their enemies. At the end of 70 years, God said, Okay, I've got my 70 years that you owe me. You can go back to the land. He placed it on the heart of Nehemiah. Remember who was the cupbearer of the king. We talked about that. And suddenly Nehemiah said, Oh, you know, I, I need to go. My city is in disarray. He had gotten a message back from some of the people who had survived to that time. How bad the city was. And so he had asked the king if he could return home. 
The king not only sent him home, but sent him with the money and the material he would need to rebuild the city, and then gave him a commission so he had the authority to do all those things. So he gets down there, they rebuild the walls, they begin to rebuild their city, and then Ezra, the great scribe, who is, after all, the book of Ezra, Ezra is the one that we have to thank for keeping the, new, the Old Testament all together. After these 70 years, he had to go and find all these things, put it all together so that they had their Old Testament that you and I are so familiar with. So once he had got that in, they realized, you know what, we've been gone out of the land for 70 years. Nobody knew their Bible. So Ezra, they built him a large platform. And he and others that were trained, he trained his men. Then they went out and they just read the Bible to people for three hours at a time. They would just read, people would take notes. And he would then not only read the Bible, then he'd go on and they would explain what those passages meant so that the people again knew the Word of God and knew what the Bible meant. Which is very, very important, much like what we do here. We teach it and we preach it together so that we know and understand what God expects of us. Remember, in the middle of all that, when the people began to read their Bible again, they began to realize how they had sinned against God. That, you know what? It was right for God to take us out of the land because we owe Him those 70 years. Not only was it right for God to take us out of the land because we owe those 70 years, but listen, we have been, as a people, disrespectful to God. We were out worshiping every God under the sun except for the one true God. We were practicing every religion there was. We were reading everything there was except for this. They were reading all the New Age philosophers. They were reading all the latest stuff. Everything but this book. And suddenly it dawned on them how wicked they were. How far they had traveled from God. And they began to weep and to cry as the word of God was read to them. And began to say, we are a sinful people. We are a sinful people. And they began to confess their sins one to another and to God. And after they had confessed their sins, and after they had apologized to God for a lengthy, lengthy time, suddenly, God did another miracle. And that's the miracle that you're going to find here in chapter 8, as we're reading the law to them, chapter 8, down to verse 10. Then he said unto them, Ezra, then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, that's the good stuff, that's the good meat. Eat the fat and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto the Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And he continues preaching. Travel over to chapter 12 and verse 43, where he is going to sum this up for us. And these two texts are where we're going to take our message from. Also that day, verse 43 of chapter 12, also that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced. For God made them rejoice with great joy. God made them rejoice with great joy. The wives also and the children rejoiced. That's what we were seeing all this week on. For that the joy of Jerusalem was heard even afar off. The people were celebrating. The people understood that God had forgiven their sins, that they were clean, that God was on their side, that God was restoring their land to them and going to bring them back. God hadn't forgot them. He had a set time of 70 years, and to the day when that 70 years was up, he brought them back in. He's beginning to rebuild their city, and they begin to look around, and they begin to see that God is working. Who would have thought this day could ever come? They're rebuilding. They're being brought back under his safety. Under his love. And suddenly, what was once sorrow turned to great joy. And everybody was just shouting and hooping and hollering and having a marvelous, marvelous time. So let's take a look at that and see what we can learn. The people who were weeping before because of their sense of sin are now rejoicing because they are forgiven. 
Let me remind you, when you're having a tough time, if you'll stop for just a moment and remember that you're forgiven, it makes difference in the world. God owes me nothing. I deserve nothing. And when my days are bad and I want to blame God for forgetting me, I just have to stop and remember, He doesn't owe me a thing. But the fact that He loved me and forgave me, sent His Son to die on the cross, if I just for a while stop and think about I am forgiven and on my way to heaven, it makes a difference in your life. So clear as the shining after the rain, so after this great confession and this great sorrow came this great joy. And so this remarkable joy, which was both spiritual and universal throughout their camp, I think is an example to you and to me. And so to that end, let's take a look and see what we see here. First of all, there is a joy that comes from a divine origin. People often in our day and time talk about happiness. Christians often talk about happiness. But I remind you, happiness is based on what's happening. I can be happy if you walk up and give me a hundred dollars. Boy, I tell you, you make it two hundred dollars and I'll do a jig. I tell you, you know, it's it's easy to be happy when good things are happening. But the joy of the Lord comes in spite of those things. Joy of the Lord, that's what came upon these people. They weren't happy people, they were a joyful people. And you and I aren't always expected to be a happy people, but we are expected to be a joyful people because joy comes from God Himself. And so there is a joy, I say to you, that is of a divine origin. Here we read it, the joy of the Lord. Sent from God into the hearts of people. Every now and then, you just have to ask God for that. Lord, I need the joy that comes from you. I don't need happiness today, but I definitely need the joy of the Lord. You'd be surprised how often the joy of the Lord could turn into happiness. But the joy of the Lord, and there is that joy. Rejoice in God Himself, in His character, in His doings. Just stop and think on God once in a while. So often we spend too much time, to be quite honest, thinking about ourselves. It's easy for us to dwell on me and my situation and my problems. But if we stop and think on God once in a while, you'd be surprised how that joy can creep into your life. When we begin to look at the blessings that come from Him, when we look at just the character of God, just take His mercy, you don't deserve it. It's of grace, unmerited favor, that God decided to love you long before you loved Him. God was seeking for me when I didn't even know I needed to be sought. I had no idea that I needed God. I had no idea that I needed forgiveness. I had no idea of all those things. I was doing my religious thing. Lo and behold, God was doing His thing and dying on the cross for me. And then calling me. And bringing me. Philippians says, Finally, my brother, rejoice in the Lord. You might not have much in this life to rejoice in, but you can always rejoice in the Lord. Look at the love that's demonstrated to you on that cross. Think of the agony he went through happily, joyfully for you. I often think of that phrase from that song when he was on the cross. I was on his mind. That thought alone will revolutionize your life. When I was on the cross, or when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. With all the heat, all the agony, and all this stuff, you ever get sick, you ever get hurt? What do you think about when you are sick? You think about nothing but getting better. When you are in pain, you think of nothing but stopping it. Yet Jesus Christ wasn't thinking of any of those things. He was thinking of you. And thinking of you. And thinking of me. What a marvelous, marvelous Savior. The joy of the Lord, you know, it possesses a deep sense of, you know, when, when, when stop to think that we are reconciled. I have been bought with a price. I'm not my own. God redeemed me. These people were excited because they were once taken out of their land and now they got to come back in. Jerusalem, which was just a story to them, they hadn't seen it. 
They were taken, many of these people had never seen Jerusalem before because they were born in Babylon, or they were born in Nineveh, or they were born in Persia. And all of a sudden, there they stand as Jews back in Jerusalem itself, a land that they had only heard stories of from their parents. How that God once did this, and how King David did that, and God used Solomon to do this. And suddenly, those stories that they had heard, they were standing in that very place. And it caused them to begin to rejoice because look what God can do. A dead people alive again. What could God do? Here I was dead in my sin and trespass. And now I am made alive. I will never die. I will live forever. All this old heart of mine might stop. This old body of mine might be laid to rest. But this soul, this creature, this man that I am will live forever. And someday as I'm up in heaven and I watch as you come through the gate, I'll be awaiting at you. Amen. And there come Barbara someday. I'll say, how did you get here? <laughs> <laughs> you must have cheated and took cuts in line. Or took it. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what we've got to look forward to. We can. You know, it's not an exciting, it's not necessarily a, 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 a thought that we like to keep in the foremost of our head all the time, but it's a truth that's there. This exalted presence that we call Jesus Christ, this person that is God, and the fact that He wants to be with us. We also joy in God, Romans in chapter 5 of Romans. Paul is sitting there saying, you know what, we have this problem and this problem and this problem. But we joy in God. Oh, sure. The world might get excited. They get a new boat, a new car, a new this, a new that. But guess what? Where will all those things go when you die? They go to your children to fight over. Or your grandchildren to fight over. You don't get to have it. You know what? There's not one new person driving a Cadillac in heaven. There isn't one person that's got a nice yacht in heaven. They got nothing in heaven that doesn't come from heaven itself. Even your clothes, you don't get they all stay behind. In a twinkling of an eye, which is pretty quick, you won't be able to blink before God will change me and clothe me in something new. But all these old clothes, they stay behind. In fact, the old flesh stays. God puts us in a whole new body. What a marvelous God. Nothing from this world, nothing from this life will contaminate that one up there. <coughs> That's something to stop and to think about. The hope of a future. A hope of a future where no sickness, no death, no poverty, and none of the things that aggravate us in this life will ever touch us there. No pain. This joy is the source of our strength. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. We used to sing that song. The joy of the Lord is my strength, right? No, I'm not a real good singer. My wife will laugh and say, don't do it again. <laughs> but that's how the song went. Sort of, kind of, maybe. Right? We'll get my wife up here to sing and then she'll do a much better job. Teach her not to laugh at me. But the joy of the Lord, that's our strength. That's what gets us through even the hard times. Even the difficult times. When I had to lay my father to rest, as tough as that day is, I, it was a day for me filled with joy. Because for 32 years, I didn't know if my dad was dead or alive. The last time I saw my dad, he was a drunkard and an alcoholic. Who beat his wife and kids. That's how I remember him. That's how he was when I left. And the thought that my dad would bust hell wide open because he had never received Jesus Christ. He wasn't going to go to hell because he beat me. He was going to go to hell because he had never received Christ as personal Lord and Savior as far as I know. The very first thing I talked to my father about when I found him was Jesus Christ. And so the day that I put my father into the ground, I knew that he had been born again and that I knew I would see him again in heaven. 
So even as difficult as the day was, I preached his funeral. My younger brother Randy looked at me and said, how can you do that? How can you stand there and preach dad's funeral? I said, I know where daddy's at. I know where dad's at. And I want to make sure the rest of the family is ready and knows that same thing. So although even on that difficult day, it was a day full of joy and rejoicing because I knew I would see that old man one more time. And I knew I'd see him in heaven and I knew his body wouldn't be touched by the sickness that had taken him. And I knew I'd see him in strength and in health. And I knew I'd, I'd see him around the throne of Jesus Christ and I'd see him standing there with God and singing with the angels. I knew all that. And so that was my strength. The joy of the Lord is what gave me the strength for that day and the following day and the days after that. The joy of the Lord is our strength. That's what makes it possible for us to go forward. When other people would say, how can you do that? It's the joy of the Lord that's our strength. It sustains us. It's stronger than this life itself. There is nothing in this life that can conquer God. And therefore, nothing in this life, no sorrow is stronger than His joy when He places it into your heart. You just need to ask for it from time to time. Maybe if you confess your faults before Him once in a while and humble yourself before the Lord, you might discover that joy that He has waiting for you. It forbids all fear. I fear so little in this life. Because after all, what's the absolute worst thing that anybody's ever going to do is send me to heaven early. I don't know that that's all that bad. Calm. Humble. Real. Deep strength. That's what joy gives to us. It's a strength which comes of holy and leads to practical results. You know, here's the thing. Ezra, as he was praising God, as he was reading the Word of God to the people, this holy book, and here's the real secret. I say it over and over and over and over again. If you learn nothing else from me, learn this. Read this book. Read it. So many of us go on a marginal week because all we talk about God and maybe we listen to religious programming, but that doesn't count if you don't read it for yourself. You don't get enough when I come and tell you what it says. We read a couple of verses today, and I'm expounding on those verses to you, but it isn't the same as when you read it for yourself. Just carry your New Testament with you. I carry one at work. Have it in my pocket all the time. I just I have a little one of those little pants with the pockets on the side. I just reach into it, pull it out, got my New Testament. I think something. I scribble a little note back in it, put it back down. But when I go to lunch, take a few minutes to read. Take a break, a couple of minutes to read. So during the day, I'm reading it, and then I tell you, I cheat to make sure I get enough of it. I have it playing in my car. You can get the Bible any translation you want. You can get it on CD. And if you're like me, my Mustang holds six CDs, which is enough for the entire New Testament. And so, one day, it goes, and, and six days a week, boom, I rest on the Sabbath and come to church. <laughs> it's the only day I'm not in my car listening to the book. That's how come I can keep it in here, so that it can flow out here to you. And that I can tell you of a truth that what God says is you. Because God's Word flows through us. It isn't enough for you to hear it on Sunday. You've got to be reading. I'm telling you, it will change your life and the life of people around you. You just read the book. Read the book. Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, he said, and all the people answered, Amen and Amen. Reminds me of a friend, Jim White, passed away now. But he used to always close his prayer by saying he was an evangelist, a wonderful, oh, he was just... He was the funniest guy. My kids loved him. And, and, you know, kids don't like preaching, but, oh, Michael just loved Jim White. But after he would pray, he'd always pray, and then he'd say, amen and amen. And then he'd start preaching. And so when I'm reading Ezra, and I see Ezra saying, amen and amen, I'm thinking, oh, Jim White, he loved that meeting there. He was just a funny guy. Just a great guy. He was a missionary for years up in Alaska. 
And so he's used to that cold. And he was a good-sized fellow, you know, a pretty girthy guy. We used to call him chubby back in the old days, but I don't think you're allowed to say chubby anymore. He was a good-sized guy. And so when he would come down here to what he called the lower 48, and he'd get to preaching, oh, he'd say, I'm sorry, preacher, i got to take off this coat. And then he'd have to take off his tie. I said, brother, don't get any more than that. Hey, you know. <laughs> and then, can you turn that air conditioner up any more than that? Hey, it's already down to 52. Everybody's got ice cream on their nose. But, and he'd still just be a sweat and away. What a wonderful, wonderful man. Just thinking about him from this simple person. But, you know, the sacrifices of joy that these people gave. That's what our people did this week. They sacrificed of their time. And even when Saturday came and these ladies were dead tired, somebody needed them and so they sacrificed. And it caused great joy. Everybody, you know, my kids, I was listening to Tilly and Ted. You probably know them better as Kayleen and Luke. But they were laying around the house and they were saying, oh, I'm so tired. But wow, how great it was. How great it was. My wife, by Wednesday, boy, they was all just out of energy. But they were exhausted in bed. And so Thursday morning, they were ready to go again. The great regret of Friday was, it's all over now. Saturday was, oh, I've got nothing to do. <laughs> they were so, a, see, that's what the joy, that's what serving God, that's what serving others in Jesus' name does for us. Gives us that great joy. The sacrifice of joy, the expressions of joy. God made them to rejoice and to cry with great joy. The family happiness is the wives and the children were all in on it. This joy was, listen, even their neighbors knew about it. The Bible says that they could hear Jerusalem rejoicing way afar off. Folks ought to know that this church, well, I tell you, it's a wonderful place to be. And folks afar off ought to hear us joy rejoicing. They ought to know that, you know what, you come here, you will be loved. Guaranteed. Don't care who you are, you will be loved when you walk through that door. Somebody is going to introduce himself to you. Somebody is going to make you feel welcome. Somebody's going to let you know that they love you and they're glad that you're here. It's just going to happen. This joy, of course, is within our reach. Why? Because first of all, we see that it's a gift from God. The joy of the Lord. It's His gift. How did it come, though? How did this joy come? Well, there were a couple of things. First of all, look at verse 3 when we went back at uh, uh, chapter 8. It says, they heard attentively. The ear of the people were attentive under the book of the law. The ears of the people were attentive. If you are attentive to the word of God, joy is coming your direction. Not only that, but it says they worshiped devoutly. They bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord in verse 6. They mourned. Penitently, All the people wept when they had heard the word of the law. They realized what sinners they were and they confessed their sin. And that brought to them joy. They understood clearly great mirth because they understood. He declared to them in verse 12 what the word of the Lord said. I don't only ask that you read this, but then we stand up here and we proclaim to you this is what is meant by this portion of scripture. This is what God wants you to learn. I often tell you, uh, on Wednesday night, I usually tell the people, next week we'll be reading that, this chapter or that chapter. And if you've got a better sermon than I've got, I'll let you preach. Most of these cowards, let me do all the preaching. <laughs> That's what happens. This joy. And because they understood, when you understand the Word of God, see, that was the difference between before I was a Christian and after I was a Christian. Before I was a Christian, I waited for people to tell me what God was saying. After I became a Christian, I found it for myself. I began to read it myself and discover that most of what I was told wasn't even true to begin with. And as I began to read the Word of God, I found out how much He loved me. How that He wasn't against me, He was for me. How He wasn't looking to punish me, but promised to take me to heaven. When suddenly I realized that God's great love wasn't something in the past, but something in the very present, something that is still with me, it caused great joy in my life. Such joy that I have not been able to be quiet about it all these years later. And then to obey earnestly. They made booze and sat under the book. Here's the thing in verse 17. We find out that they had forgotten that God had instituted a, it was called the Feast of Tabernacles. 
Everybody was supposed to leave their house. It was to remind them of his great deliverance from Egypt. And all the people were supposed to come out of their houses and pitch a little tent. Actually, what they'd do is they would get these bushes, and out of these bushes they would make a little tabernacle, a little shady place. And they would live under those branches, under those bushes, sort of a brush arbor, and they would live under that for this week to remind them of how God brought them out and through the wilderness brought them into the land. Well, the people hadn't been doing that. In fact, you know when the last time anybody had done that? Was when Joshua was alive. And they said, you mean this hasn't happened since the days of Joshua? All these hundreds of years later and nobody has ever bothered to keep that? Well, let's keep it today. This is the day, this is the time of that year when God said you're supposed to do it. So let's do it. When Ezra read to them that requirement for that particular week, they said, let's do it right now. And everybody came out of their houses, they built those little tents, and they lived in them. See, not only did they hear the Word of God, but they obeyed the Word of God. It's not good enough for me just to read what the book says and then tell you, hey, you better live like this. That's not my job to tell you how to live. That's God's job to tell you how to live. The book's job is to tell me how to live. And then I tell you what I learned that week. And then the Holy Spirit says to you, you know what, it might not be bad for you, do you think? If it worked for the preacher, it might work for you. And as they obey, but you can't obey what you do not read. When God and you are sitting down in heaven and he asks you, how much of that book have you read? You better be able to say more than the cover. Imagine you and Jesus getting into a Bible discussion in heaven. How well prepared are you? When he starts laughing about something he did in John, you going to know anything about it? How about when that paralyzed guy who they tore up the city, remember, and lowered him in? Will you even recognize him when he walks through heaven if you've never read the story? All those people that Paul introduces to you in the end of Romans, and you hear those names, will you eat? Will they even be familiar to you? Have you ever read that? There's a lot of people in heaven you're going to meet you won't even know who. When they introduce themselves, you say, I'm sorry, who are you? They said, oh, I'm uh, found over here in Romans chapter 16. Oh, sorry, I never read that. God! <laughs> Jesus, come on over. Excuse me, you didn't do what? Hey, make sure you read the book at least once before you go. We've got in the, in, in the uh, bulletin, We've got a section of scriptures for that by the end of the year you will have read. If you've been following that long, you'll have read the whole Bible all the way through in one year. Okay. If you do what I do, you can read the whole New Testament every single week. I go through the entire New Testament every single week. This evening, we're only 27 books in that one. Fine, because the joy of the Lord, that's what I want you to experience. When you're having a rough time and a bad day, and I'm having a rough time and a bad day, and you come by and say, Preacher, you read the book today. Here, what am I talking about? Just a minute. So let's learn this then. Let us seek after the joy that's found in God. How is it found? It is found through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, by whom we have seen or received the This is true. This is safe. And this is satisfying joy. And then what? Well, I suppose there is such a thing as a joyless heart. You can meet people who have no joy. I trust that you and I will have no personal experience in that. There are those that look into their heart and they have no joy. Nothing to rejoice about. Every day is a difficulty. Every day is a struggle. They couldn't find something good to say if they had to. They just don't have anything good to say. They apparently don't know Jesus. 
in a real and practical way. There's also deadly joys. You know, if my joy, I suppose, comes in the things I can earn and gather up in this life, that's all I've got. I was talking with one of the fellows last night. And he said to me, you know what, I was thinking about it. And all those things that people say about me. I'm thinking to myself, he said, of the emperors of Rome. He said, I'm thinking particularly of those emperors you read about in the Bible. They owned the whole world. This guy had everything. He owned the entire empire. And yet now for 2,000 years he's been burning in hell with absolutely nothing. Doesn't even have a throne to sit on. Got nothing. And many of his slaves went into heaven. And here he is, the richest, most powerful man in the world at the time of Jesus Christ. In hell instead. Why did they bother gathering up all that stuff? What a waste of time. How true is that statement? I tell you this, it's a bad fireplace for all the heat goes straight up the chimney. See, true Christianity spreads joy all around. The fireplace supposed to warm the house. You know, if, if it's built properly and it's got the flues going in there, much of the heat radiates out into the room and warms you up. But if you put a fire and just had a stack straight above it, you wouldn't get no warmth at all. Ben Franklin spent a lot of time designing chimneys just so American houses could be warm. They still, the chimney still uses his principle to keep you warm. That little gate inside that thing. Oh, Ben Franklin, thank him for it. Next time you're in there, thanks, Ben. And you adjust that thanks to the house getting warm. Faith is the key to happiness. Faith is the key to joy. See, faith is that key that unlocks that treasure chest that God has. God has a life for you, the Bible says, that is full of joy and unspeakable joy. But how will you ever find it? You don't know the treasure There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of promises in this book made to you. But we get none of those promises if we don't find them. Now I could cheat, I suppose, and tell you where they all are. But you wouldn't like that. You would say, no, preacher. Yeah, I would. <laughs> I'd rather find it myself. Part of the joy is in discovering them for yourself. I tell you, when you sit there and you read, I remember the first time when I got my Bible and I started reading it, I found this thing to be true of that. I mean, you know, I'm underlining and writing in my Bible. You couldn't hardly find the original words because I had circled and written so many times over. Them. Go ahead. Read it. Start with your New Testament. You'll be like it. And when you're all done with that and you memorize the, the New Testament, go back and stay your own. That's all there. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We found that true this week. Those people who labored all week, it wasn't their energy that kept them going. It was the joy in the Lord. When God would bring in a few more children, because we all knew it, we knew we didn't have enough kids here in this church. Look around and see how many you got. But the fact that we had 49 kids here from these neighbors, we had several months, Martha and, and, some of the, and Joseph and some of the other ladies spent their time talking to mamas who had brought their children into our church. A couple of the kids said, you know what, my family would probably like this church. So we look forward to engaging them in conversation and seeing them as go ahead. That's the joy of the Lord. It was because they found that serving God put a smile on her face. Mary came out. Mary just went through surgery. But Mary came on in every day was here. Why? Because it brought her great joy to be here serving with them kids. Had a little bit of pain, a little bit of discomfort. But God took care of all that. So the joy of the Lord, that's our real strength. Father, I thank you so much for what you have done this week in our church. Thank you, Father, for the joy that you have given to our people as they discovered 
serving, Father not serving only the adults, but even in serving children. Giving to them the gospel. Telling some of these boys and girls for the very first time that Jesus loved them. To watch the smile on their face. Father, one of the benefits of this is my own grandson. Decided he wanted to be baptized. So in a moment, we'll baptize him this morning. If Mr. Christian comes, so you go remind him. So, Father, we ask that to your people, we thank for taking the business this morning. They're here without their grandpa, without their dad. That you deliver to their hearts today. Father, for these who have struggled and worked so hard, and these, Father, who have come to your preachers, I pray you deliver in the each and every home the joy of the Lord. Hear our prayer, every time. There is a need. Need today, dear Father. That's my request. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you need to pray, the altar is open. You come. If you need joy, you come and ask God for that. Family. 
Secondly, I'd like to apologize. We're standing here in a warm bath in the Texas street today. Uh, Luke and I have spent some time on it. We got the heater working and uh, the circulator going. And uh, so my grandson and I came over last night and turned the switch. Our bank that fills itself and warms the water. I tell you, it just jumped to us. <laughs> this is Mr. Christian. And Christian, have you received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? I am glad that you have. Then based on your profession and his command, I do not baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with human baptism. Risen to walk in the name of the Just one more time through and we'll be dismissed. Well, I'm